1998. I'll never forget it. It was the year when Capcom unleashed the long-awaited sequel to its wildly successful survival horror game, Resident Evil. Resident Evil 2 was a smash hit redefining the survival horror genre while elevating Capcom and its creators to newfound heights. Soon after, the news was out to the whole world revealing that Resident Evil 2 would arrive on other platforms beyond the original PlayStation. From personal computers to Nintendo 64 and beyond, this beloved sequel appeared across a wide range of platforms, making it perfect for DF Retro. Thus, today marks our first foray into the world of Resident Evil, and we're going big. We'll examine the development of Resident Evil 2, discuss its achievements, and compare every single version of the game. Curious to see how that miraculous Nintendo 64 conversion really stacks up? And which version is the best today? All this and more is coming up on this special episode of DF Retro. Hey, it's up to us to take out Umbrella. When the original Resident Evil hit the market in March of 1996, it was met with critical and commercial success, surprising to even Capcom itself. Players everywhere loved the blend of horror, action, and storytelling, but while it's difficult to imagine, it was a risk for Capcom at a very delicate point in its storied history. At this time, Capcom was actually facing difficult times. Uh, Street Fighter II had faded in popularity, the arcade business hadn't been was not what it was in the years prior. Capcom really needed a hit. Started with the intention of basically remaking the Famicom title Sweet Home for a new generation, Resident Evil helped shape the burgeoning survival horror genre with its steep challenge, focus on resource management, and its remarkable 3D visuals, at least for the time. It was a huge hit that demonstrated the capabilities of the still new generation of game consoles so it's no surprise that Capcom quickly greenlit a follow-up. For the sequel, Capcom really wanted to repeat the success that they had seen with Mega Man 2 and Street Fighter 2, in the sense that the sequel is much bigger and much more ambitious than the previous game. So for Resident Evil 2, director Shinji Mikami from the original handed over the directorial reins to Hideki Kamiya. He really liked Kamiya's vision for gaming and thought that Kamiya had a lot of potential for success. And he was right. Kamiya's strong vision for action games would lead him to create many classic titles with his teams, but prior to Resident Evil 2, his experience was rather limited. He did work as a planner on the original Resident Evil, but his first project was Nazu Makaimura Incredible Tunes, a reworking of the Incredible Tune Machine featuring ghouls and ghost characters for Saturn and PlayStation. But his legacy truly began with the Biohazard 2 project. Initial development on the game went smoothly. Many elements from the first Resident Evil, such as fixed camera angles and pre-rendered backgrounds, were carried over to the sequel, but the setting was shifted from an isolated manner to Raccoon City itself. Two new characters were introduced, the game was demoed to the press, and it was set for launch in early 1997. But while things were moving quickly, that doesn't mean it was going well. Some people within Capcom had their doubts about the state of the game. They felt very unsure about how the game's quality was turning out. A lot of people had concerns that it wasn't as fun or it wasn't as interesting, nor was it as groundbreaking as the original. So going back to their legacy of having made games like Mega Man 2 and Street Fighter 2, in its current state, where there wasn't enough innovation over the original, there was a sense that the game might underwhelm and that might uh, destroy the momentum that they had created with the first game. However, no one inside Capcom really had a good answer for what to do with it. So the executive producer of Capcom's development at the time, Yoshiki Okamoto, sought out the services of a man named uh, Noboru Sugimura. He was a script writer for a lot of TV and anime programs, including uh, the Super Sentai series. Sugimura examined the build of Resident Evil 2. He had a lot of feedback regarding the story and the universe. 
His biggest criticisms were that the universe didn't have enough connections to the first game and that the characters and how they interacted weren't deep enough. And so the decision was made. Resident Evil 2, or Biohazard 2 I suppose, was scrapped and restarted from scratch. This incomplete version of the game has since been dubbed Resident Evil 1.5 by the community, and the quest to uncover its mysteries continues to this day, with incomplete versions of the game floating around, giving players an idea of what may have been. But while examining cancelled projects is certainly interesting, its cancellation was most likely for the better, and the game we did receive has become a modern classic. Fans were given their first shot at the game with the trial version released alongside Resident Evil The Director's Cut. The first release came with the Japanese edition, which also includes a demo for Rockman Neo, the pre-release name for Rockman Dash in Japan, or Mega Man Legends as it would be known elsewhere. This trial version of Resident Evil 2 is interesting as it includes some slight layout differences compared to the final game. The area behind Kendo's gun shop, for instance, features zombies trapped behind this fence. In the final game, the door is a 3D object which can open as zombies force their way through. In the trial, however, this is pre-rendered and the zombies remain trapped. The player then continues down the alley instead out to the street. This alley is blocked in the final game, forcing you to go through the basketball court area. This door in the police station also leads to a different area. This certainly isn't the last time we'd see the tactic of including a demo of a hotly anticipated game with another title, but it worked here. Resident Evil 2 then was finally released in January of 1998 to critical acclaim and would go on to sell millions of copies. It had a huge marketing push, including a pair of commercials directed by George Romero, which aired in Japan. It's widely considered one of the best games in the series and has continued to influence the franchise going forward. At its core, Resident Evil 2 offers that perfect blend of things that were great in the original game along with a lot of new features. Once again, players have the choice between two playable characters, Leon S. Kennedy and Claire Redfield, who basically replaced Elza Walker featured in the cancelled version of the game. The final shipped on two discs with each disc representing a single character, and it features a considerably larger game world to explore ranging from the streets of Raccoon City to the depths below. It boasts a more engaging story this time with several new characters encountered along the way, including Ada Wong and Sherry Birkin among others, and on top of that, it's even more replayable thanks to unlockable weapons, extra modes like the fourth survivor and the tofu survivor. It was absolutely packed with content, and it was also a technical showpiece for the original PlayStation. The juxtaposition of 3D characters on bitmapped backgrounds may seem rather quaint by today's standards, but at the time, it was a stunning achievement and a significant improvement over the original Resident Evil. Character models are significantly more detailed with improved modeling and texture work. Shading is also enhanced, completely eliminating the telltale PlayStation dithering artifacts, while the variety of enemies is ramped up significantly. Background graphics are also more complex, and although they are pre-rendered, it's clear that Capcom's background artists and perhaps the workstations used to create the backgrounds had evolved significantly since the original. From what I understand, it took quite a long time to render out each background for this game using these high-end workstations, but the shading, model detail, and lighting are all a massive step up. The soundtrack is equally memorable. Rather than relying on pre-recorded digital audio tracks, Resident Evil 2 uses sampled playback via the PlayStation's audio chip. And of course, as a 90s game, it features full motion video. But unlike many games on the PlayStation, the video plays back at a full 30 frames per second and looks awesome. Unlike the original game, all of the characters are rendered using CGI graphics rather than filmed actors. Looking at the big picture then, the style of presentation on display here was rather common at the time, but Resident Evil 2 did it better than most, at least in 1998. By relying on pre-rendered background art, developers could pour additional geometry into the character models while presenting an even more detailed world. Each environment is mapped out using a collision mesh, which determines where players can and cannot move. It's invisible to the player, but helps define each play space. 
The backgrounds themselves then are stored using a hardware compressed format, which shares elements with MPEG-1 compression, which is then decompressed in real time by the MDEC coprocessor in the PlayStation. The frame is basically composed of a series of strips, which are uploaded to VRAM, then when complete, moved to system memory, then uploaded back to VRAM every frame to clear each scene. Areas of the background which allow the player to pass in front of or behind objects are basically displayed as sprite objects without requiring any transform or lighting, since that is baked into the asset. Since the PlayStation has no Z buffer, these are placed at defined Z values in the scene and feature an alpha channel of sort to allow objects to seamlessly pass behind them. Final frame buffer output then is 320 by 224 pixels using PlayStation's 15-bit color mode. Now, it's overall more complex than that, of course, but the resulting scene here gives the impression of a proper three-dimensional environment, which the player can freely explore. And explore they did. Resident Evil 2 quickly became a top seller for the original PlayStation, but it wouldn't be long before the game started to appear on other platforms. But it could have happened earlier. You see, at one point, Resident Evil 2 was announced for the Sega Saturn. The trailer footage out there suggests that it was based on the cancelled version of the game, but beyond that, there really isn't a lot of information available. From what we do know, however, the porting team seemed to struggle with the hardware, and it was quietly cancelled. Resident Evil wouldn't appear again on a Sega console until the Dreamcast. And that version is just one of many ports and conversions that would arrive in due time. The Nintendo 64 port is perhaps the most interesting, in fact, but each version is worth discussing, so let's go in the order of release. The next version to release isn't a port at all, it's the DualShock Edition for PlayStation. This appeared seven or eight months after the original game, packing in several new features. Naturally, this version supports the DualShock controller with Rumble and Analog Stick support, while introducing an Arrange Mode, Extreme Battle Mode, and new playable characters including Chris Redfield from the original game. Aside from the content differences, however, this looks visually identical to the original release. Still, this is one of the best versions of the game you can buy. It appears that the first iteration of the game to appear on a non-PlayStation console, then, is Resident Evil 2 for the Tiger Gamecom. This wretched system was a complete failure due to its limited hardware, horrible screen, and generally poor selection of games, but Resident Evil 2 is one of the more interesting titles for the platform. The development team basically attempted to recreate the shooting and item management aspects of the game, but little else. Slow moving sprites are used to represent on-screen characters and zombies, while monochromatic backgrounds are created to simulate the original level design, to some degree. It's very slow paced, but it kinda works. In some ways it reminds me of the unreleased Game Boy Color conversion of the original game. But it wasn't the only Tiger version of Resident Evil. Later, the company released a 99X version of the game. This is a small portable LCD system. Unfortunately, due to its scarcity and steep prices online, I've never seen one in person, but YouTube videos suggest that it's even more limited than the GameCom version. It's neat that it exists and apparently even supports multiplayer in the form of a score battle, but beyond that, it's not worth touching, I'd imagine. The first proper conversion of the game, then, appeared in early 1999 for Windows 95 slash 98. Released in North America as Resident Evil 2 Platinum Edition, the PC version of the game appears to be derived from the DualShock Edition on PlayStation. It supports either 320x240 or 640 x480 resolution in both software and direct 3D mode. Based on testing, performance on older PCs isn't especially great, especially in software mode, but if you had a decent gaming PC with a 3D accelerator, it was quite playable. The maximum frame rate is still capped at 30 frames per second though, but at least it supports higher resolution 3D rendering. Which is interesting since character models and enemies can be displayed at 4 times the resolution, which creates a bit of a mismatch between the foreground and backgrounds. This version also supports bilinear texture filtering on 3D objects. There's even several video options to adjust your experience here in the options menu, and certain settings, such as shading, can be toggled in-game by hitting buttons such as F3. This isn't my favorite version, however, as it's somewhat buggy and difficult to enjoy on modern PCs. It'll work, but not as well as you might like. Thankfully, there's a much better solution for this, but we'll get to that later. 
Still, this version is important in that it was the first proper port of Resident Evil 2 released after the PlayStation version. But I think many folks watching are most interested in one specific version of the game, Resident Evil 2 for Nintendo 64. This is perhaps one of the most impressive conversions in the history of console gaming. It was developed primarily by Angel Studios, now known as Rockstar San Diego, with assistance from Factor 5. The challenge should be evident to anyone. The team needed to compress a double CD-ROM game onto a 64 megabyte Nintendo 64 cartridge. And impressively, they succeeded. The challenges were vast, with each element of the presentation requiring a bespoke approach. Full motion video is perhaps the most challenging. With its lack of cartridge space or bespoke hardware decompression like PlayStation, the developers had to create their own tools and methods for compressing the data into an acceptable form. Video data was first converted from RGB to YCBCR using chroma subsampling to reduce chroma to a fraction of its size while only having the luminance. Bitrate varies per clip, sequences with lots of motion are encoded at a higher bitrate while low motion sequences can make do with a reduced bitrate instead, all in the name of saving space. The frame rate of the videos is halved from 30 frames per second to 15. Interpolation then is used to make up the difference, which improves fluidity. Notice how every other frame is basically a ghost frame as a result of this technique? The resolution of the clips was also reduced, and the N64 RCP was used to scale the image to full screen, which, of course, also saves on storage space. Frame persistence is also variable in some shots, with certain still scenes relying on frame holding, and audio, of course, is carefully synced to the frames as well. Every possible nip and tuck was made to find the right balance and deliver acceptable results and all of this was done without the aid of video decompression hardware during the era of MPEG-1, when video compression wasn't exactly that efficient. So how did they fare? Well, it's plainly obvious that the Nintendo 64 version falls short of the original PlayStation game. The luminance is halved, the reliance on motion interpolation reduces fluidity, resolution is lower, and compression lossier. All these things are extremely evident. Yet, against all odds, it works. They managed to fit 15 minutes worth of full motion video on this cartridge, something that no other developer had even attempted. It's an impressive showing. Then there's the backgrounds and object rendering. This version is wholly unique in many ways. While most ports are more or less based on the PlayStation version, the Nintendo 64 port handles things quite differently. For one thing, it takes advantage of the system's Z buffer when it comes to depth calculation while characters feature entirely new textures designed to fit within the constraints of the system complete with bilinear filtering. Background resolution is reduced across the board, with the system basically stretching and filtering assets to fill the screen. What's curious about this, however, is that the frame buffer resolution can vary based on whether you're using the expansion pack or not. Without the expansion pack, the game's frame buffer seems to remain locked at 320 by 240 throughout the game. The artwork is generally lower resolution and the 8x8 compression artifacts visible as a result of its JPEG-like compression are plainly obvious, but it still works and it looks pretty good on a CRT. But things get more interesting when you plug in an expansion pack. Essentially, the game varies its frame buffer resolution on a per scene basis. By varying the resolution, however, the game essentially switches output modes constantly. Within the first few scenes of the game, Resident Evil 2 will bounce between 240p and 480i output 5 or 6 times or more. This switch in resolution is seamless on a CRT television, lending the game a sharper, higher resolution appearance when possible, but when playing with an external line doubler or scaler, this becomes a real problem as it can take a lot of time to switch resolutions. Basically, this version of the game is just barely playable on an OSSC and completely unplayable on the Frame Meister, if I'm honest. But how does it compare visually to the PlayStation version then? Well, it's impressive, but once again, there are visible corners cut. Additional compression artifacts are visible as a result of the conversion and compression, while detail is lost in other scenes due to reduction in asset size. Backgrounds feature the same 8x8 macro blocks in terms of construction, but it's a lot more evident on Nintendo 64 as well. 
There were rumors, however, that the Nintendo 64 version features higher resolution backgrounds, and in terms of what is drawn to the frame buffer, this can certainly be true, but the source artwork is reduced across the board. PlayStation simply features more detail in each scene all around. But honestly, despite this, it still looks pretty darn nice on the N64, and without a direct comparison, you'd be surprised at how well it holds up. And on the plus side, character model rendering is slightly improved, at least in some ways. The N64's hardware anti-aliasing smooths out edges on character models, leading to less visible shimmering. As I mentioned earlier, however, the textures were modified to fit within the constraints of the systems, and the quality is slightly reduced as a result on that front. All of this was achieved in just 12 months by nine full-time developers working from C code that more closely resembled assembly code while struggling with comments written in Japanese. It was a tremendous effort from what I understand. But this isn't everything. The audio is perhaps the most impressive thing about this port. Resident Evil 2 uses voice acting for all of its cutscenes and features 200 pieces of original music with loads of bespoke samples, all designed for the PlayStation's dedicated audio chip. The N64 lacks a dedicated sound chip, however, and in fact, its sound libraries seem rather limited. Even Angel Studios struggled to find a solution early on, which is why they sought the aid of one Chris Hulsbeck, along with two other members of Factor 5. These guys know audio, but they were up to the task. Chris helped develop a sound system known as Musi X for Nintendo 64 and the Game Boy. The sample-based system allowed developers to define their own unique sound samples while working in real time with a Windows application, making development a snap. The PlayStation already has support for this style of music playback though, and many games rely on samples rather than streaming digital audio. Did you know that titles like Chrono Cross rely on the PlayStation sound chip as opposed to playing back digital audio? Yeah, it was quite capable. And Chris Hulsbeck's Musi X system was also very capable, only on Nintendo 64. With Resident Evil 2, he managed to increase the quality of the samples over the original while perfectly reproducing the PlayStation soundtrack in its entirety. Take a listen. It sounds nearly identical, doesn't it? This quality of soundtrack on Nintendo 64 is a very rare thing indeed, but Chris nailed it. Musi X even supports Dolby Surround offering improved spatial awareness in the right setup, and developers were free to license this provided they met certain requirements. Of course, while the soundtrack is completely intact, the same cannot be said of the sound effects and dialogue. This again comes down to lack of space, there's only so much that can be done here. Voices, for instance, are compressed and played back at a much lower rate. Take a listen. What's going on in this town? Hold on. What's going on in this town? Hold on. While the quality is reduced, the fact that we have this much spoken dialogue in a Nintendo 64 title on top of full motion video is simply remarkable. And that's not even touching on the gameplay changes. The N64 version features a second reworked control scheme allowing direct movement with the analog stick as opposed to tank controls. It works supremely well to the point where it's borderline game breaking. You can also adjust the violence level and blood color. There's an item randomizer which varies item placement on different playthroughs and a selection of documents known as the EX files designed to fill new players in on what happened in the series while teasing elements related to Resident Evil Zero. That's right. Resident Evil Zero was originally in development for N64 with a release date set for one year after the release of RE2. But as we know now, it never came to pass and was instead moved to Nintendo GameCube. One last thing I wanted to mention though is the doors. They move at 60 frames per second on PlayStation, but less than half that on Nintendo 64. Yeah, I know, that's a little silly, but 
I couldn't help but mention that one. Overall though, the N64 port deserves its legendary status. It's an amazing conversion, one of the best we've ever seen. Now, the next port arrived shortly after the N64 version, Resident Evil 2 for Sega Dreamcast. This conversion first shipped in late 99 as the Value Plus version, just in Japan, and it includes a demo disc for the soon-to-be-released Resident Evil Code Veronica. So what's this version all about then? Well, it's basically a direct PC port. It uses the Windows CE libraries and the exact same data and compression schemes as that version. It's virtually identical, only it runs properly. So how does it actually look? Well, it runs at 640x480 resolution, supports VGA output, and does not filter textures, which I think is a smart move given the original artwork. In comparison to PlayStation, one of the first things you might notice is that there's a red tint to everything. This is the result of the RGB 555 to 888 conversion performed by the game, and it's also evident in that older PC version. This color space conversion is to blame for the slight shift, but to be honest, it's not bad and the warmer appearance kind of works well in many scenes. One cool bonus in this version though is the inclusion of VMU support. The game shows your ammo and life status right on the VMU screen. It's a neat idea in theory, but since I typically play horror games in a darker environment, it's not especially practical. Still, it's a nice touch. The overall look then is pretty nice. It's cleaner than any other version to date, but as with those other versions, background resolution remains a sticking point since the original renders seem to have been lost and all we have are these lower resolution iterations. That said, if you look closely, you'll spot some additional detail in the Dreamcast backgrounds which are missing on PlayStation, though they're still rather low resolution. Which is a shame since certain ports of Resident Evil 3, such as the Dreamcast version here, feature higher resolution backgrounds which look great and pair nicely with the higher resolution models. The only real issue with this version for me then is that the Dreamcast pad just isn't all that great for Resident Evil. The D-pad is poor and tank controls on analog sticks are awful. Also, while it's mostly identical to the PlayStation and PC versions, there are some subtle differences here and there, such as this. Here's the PlayStation version. And now on Dreamcast, you'll notice there's no music. This only seems to occur in certain scenes, like in front of the police station here, but it's worth pointing out. At least the FMV quality is superb. The videos play back at a full 30 frames per second like PlayStation, but with a much higher bitrate and at a full 4x3 rather than in letterbox mode. So more of the image is visible and it looks super clean. This absolutely blows away every other version we've seen yet. Still, if you can deal with these limitations, it's well worth checking out. But before we jump to the next official version of the game, I wanted to mention this impressive conversion of Resident Evil 2 for Game Boy Advance. Developed by Raylight Games, this demo was created to showcase the capabilities of its Blue Roses engine, which can display true 3D graphics on a GBA. This was created and pitched to Capcom, but they turned it down, thus it never happened. Finish the demo and you even get a short look at a 3D Street Fighter demonstration. This is one of the more interesting takes on RE2 then, as it shares very little with the original games. The models all look and animate completely differently than the original. More impressively, there's no pause between screen changes. Moving between each area is instantaneous on Game Boy Advance, which is not the case for any other version we've looked at thus far. The big question then is, could they have replicated all of the other elements, including FMV, on a GBA cart? I suppose we'll never know for sure, but it does look pretty neat. The next and final console version of Resident Evil 2 to be released then was the GameCube conversion. Likely made to complete the series on Nintendo's console, this is one of the best looking ports we've looked at thus far. It features higher resolution character rendering, crisp backgrounds that match the PlayStation version, and it ships on a single disc rather than two. It definitely looks great, especially compared to the other versions, and on top of that, it doesn't exhibit the color space conversion issues we noticed on Dreamcast and PC. Everything feels just right. But there are some interesting additions and changes as well. For one thing, the title screen voiceover has been changed. Previous versions sound like this. Resident Evil. 
but on GameCube, it's been changed to sound like this. Resident Evil 2. Quite the difference, wouldn't you say? The other major change and one of the biggest improvements to this version is the option to skip in-game cutscenes. Hit the start button during most cutscenes and the game will skip over the scene entirely, making for a smoother experience when replaying the game. Unfortunately, you cannot skip door sequences, as was possible in the original PC version, but still, this is the only version to offer cutscene skipping as an option. This version also includes the Type-C controls first introduced in Resident Evil Remake for the GameCube, where you use the right trigger to move rather than relying on the D-pad or analog stick. Everything else though is pretty much on par. Same assets, same options as the DualShock version, and the same audio. It doesn't feature any of the extra N64 features either, likely due to its origins as a PlayStation port. Capcom didn't handle the coding on that version after all. It does at least offer a variety of different video modes, but the best one isn't official. Basically, you can use the homebrew software Swiss to force your desired resolution, which means it's possible to play the game in its original 240p resolution, only with greatly improved character rendering. This mode, when played on a CRT, looks especially fantastic, and it's my favorite way to replay the game on the console since it eliminates that mismatch between character and background resolution while still offering cleaner character rendering. It just looks more consistent, yet improved over the original PS1 game. The only downside to this version is the quality of the video playback. Unlike the Dreamcast version, the videos are once again presented in letterboxed format with a reduction in quality. It's still improved over the original PS1 version, mind you, but I'd have preferred the Dreamcast cutscenes in this version. Though, of course, that one shipped on two GD-ROMs, and this is just a single GameCube disc. Overall, though, this version of the game, it's pretty good on the GameCube. But now we come to the final port, the 2006 PC Source Next version. This is a re-release of the PC original, with changes made to improve PC compatibility while offering the game on a single DVD with the highest quality cutscenes we've seen to date. And that's perhaps the most significant improvement here. The cutscenes are presented in 4x3 like the Dreamcast version, but with an even higher bitrate. I'm genuinely surprised that versions of the movies exist at this quality to begin with, as it's a massive step up over every other version. The extra clarity really gives us insight into how these scenes were made back on those workstations in the first place. The rest of the game is fine, but it doesn't play that well on modern Windows, at least until you install one little patch which solves everything. Resident Evil 2 Classic Rebirth might just be the best way to enjoy the game today. Created by Gemini, this simple DLL file drops right into your install folder and improves many things with this port. It adds support for high resolutions, well beyond what the original game could offer. It fixes any compatibility issues with Windows. It offers X input support for modern gamepads, translates everything to English, fixes color space conversion issues, corrects some bugs in the original release, and adds proper mod support. Not only that, this version eliminates load times almost entirely. Transitions between every screen are now instantaneous, and you can even skip door loading sequences. This makes playing through the game extremely fun and simple. The only limitation is that you can't skip cinematic cutscenes in-game. When you look at all these improvements, however, Classic Rebirth is a joy to play and perhaps the best way to enjoy Resident Evil 2 today. The only issue here stems from the low-res backgrounds, which look really bad next to the super high-res characters you can now play with. That said, if you can get your PC running on an older CRT, it won't be much of an issue, but that seems rather unlikely in most setups. I suppose this kind of answers the question posed at the start of the video then. What is the best way to play the game? Well, in my book, there are really two answers here. The PC version with the classic Rebirth patch applied is basically the best, most fluid version of the game and definitely a fantastic way to jump in. But my second favorite would have to be the GameCube version with 240p forced via the Swiss application. Not that any version of Resident Evil 2 is bad, mind you. Every single iteration is interesting in its own right and well worth revisiting today. But of course, there is now another way to experience the game, or at least it's coming very soon. Announced years ago, Resident Evil 2 is finally receiving the full remake treatment, and it looks glorious. It feels like a proper mix of classic Resident Evil with Resident Evil 4-style gameplay. 
It's fully 3D and appears to have been expanded greatly over the original. More of Raccoon City is now explorable and everything is seamless. Not to mention it runs at 60 frames per second and showcases Capcom's RE engine at its best. Rest assured that we'll cover this one in great detail when it arrives in January, and if you're watching this after its release, well, go back and check out the comparisons we made with the original version. But as for the original version, now more than 20 years later, it's still an important and memorable game. I think what really strikes me even today, more than 20 years after the release of this game, is just how much of a leap it was over the original. And while Resident Evil 2 didn't start the Resident Evil series, obviously, it really established a lot of the series' sense of identity, especially in terms of the action elements and how characters in the game would interact with each other. So in terms of plot, Resident Evil 2 introduced elements like romance and friendship, family, and how to deal with emotion. And while this might seem very elementary by today's standards, you really have to admire the the contributions that Sugimura brought to Resident Evil 2. Indeed, this is the game that laid down the rules for Resident Evil and one that has influenced both the series and gaming in general. It's a landmark achievement, even if it feels somewhat dated by today's standards, and it holds a place in many gamers' hearts. It's also a game that has persisted across different generations with a huge number of ports. From the miraculous Nintendo 64 conversion, to the weird attempts at bringing the game to handheld systems, to the fully modded PC version. There are so many ways to enjoy Resident Evil 2. So, while we wait for the remake to emerge next year, let's all crack open that CD case one more time to experience Resident Evil 2. you believe me? There are only three STARS members left now. Captain Wesker, Jill, and myself. We don't know where Barry is. Thank <laughs> you.